So how the fuck do you go from founding Just Eat, which is pretty cool, to owning a rugby club? In reality, I was never that cool. And so what happened was... <laughs> this is David Buttress. He is the owner and chairman of Welsh United Rugby Championship Club, Dragons, and is the former co-founder and CEO of Just Eat. In the UK, especially in sport, we have a history promotion relegation and our supporters like it, broadcasters like it. We're in an entertainment business. I don't want like franchise sport. I want sport that connects the communities that they're in. Is rugby still relevant? Nothing has a divine right to stay relevant. So where's your challenge? International rugby is a no-brainer. If you look generally at the club game level, the game is significantly smaller. Now compare that to football. The Premier League is a huge product. Rugby needs to look at that and go, how the hell do we get the club game closer to the international game in terms of experience, product and revenue? How much does a rugby player get paid? For a top, top international player, you're probably earning somewhere between... David, I am so excited for this. We've been looking forward to this for a long time. Thanks to Mike Chalfin for making the intro. Wonderful, Mr. Chalfin. But thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure. Great to be here. Rock and roll. You can start today. Oh, that's exciting. Um, before we actually go into it, can we ask you a little bit about the context of how you got into rugby from the business background that you had before? Yeah, so my granddad was a massive rugby fan. So he was like the treasurer of Ponypool Rugby Club, which is a big rugby club in Wales, an historic club, um, like a CFO, except imagine like cotton bags on his living room with full of like coins and cash, that type of like gritty CFO. So I grew up around rugby from the age of four. And um, so when Just Eat became a success, I always knew I wanted to be involved in sport and be involved in rugby principally. And then what happened, the CEO of Welsh Rugby Union, Martin Phillips, who was the previous CEO of B&Q, and he actually now the chairman of the English uh, Professional League. Martin just rang me because he saw an interview in the Times with Just Eat's IPO saying, this bloke's Welsh. So like, he made the stereotypical assumption, well, if he's Welsh, he probably likes rugby. There was nothing about rugby. In this. It was all about like takeaway and blah, blah. And um, he just reached out to me and I got this random email from the CEO of the Welsh Rugby Union saying, David, you're Welsh. Are you interested in rugby? And can we have a coffee? And I was like, well, he had me at a low, right? Because I, you know, <laughs> you are interested in rugby. rugby. Yeah. So, and so I went and met Martin at the salubrious Majeski Stadium in Reading um, and literally said to me, do you want to be the chairman of one of our professional rugby teams? And that it, conversation literally evolved from there. What was your thought process around that? Why did you say yes? How did that look like in terms of your decision making? It was kind of like the most paradoxical business decision I've ever made because it, most things you start off really skeptical, like I'm not going to invest or I'm not going to buy this business or I'm not going to do this. And if I am, I need to prove that it makes sense and you'd be quite rigorous in that approach. But it's probably the only thing I've ever done. I went to it, well, the answer is yes. Now I have to make it make sense from all the other parameters. But the point is when it doesn't in reality in professional sport, because the money will never make sense in professional sport unless you're like an NFL team or an NBA team. So you, I made it make sense from the point of I care about this. I'm passionate about it. Not everything you do in life should be about or making money or some things are about pleasure and experience and uh, connecting to a community of people that I cared about because I grew up there. So this was like um, this was like no other business decision. I wouldn't even call it a business decision. It was a heart decision. The fact that came from um, you know the top of the Welsh Rugby Union, and then you're talking about the clubs as well. It's quite a unique structure that you have in Wales, and it feeds That's down to what you've just had now. <laughs> well, can you can you tell us a little bit about it because it is very different to what we see in other leagues. Yeah, it's, it's hard if you're not Welsh to really get this, but in Wales, rugby, would it's not just a stereotypical. Rugby is the number one sport. So it's for rugby, it wouldn't be the main sport in most countries. I'm trying to think maybe South Africa, is it? I don't, but it wouldn't be New Zealand, obviously. But in most countries, it'd be a second, third, or even fourth sport. In England, rugby union is probably third or fourth, I'd imagine. Yeah. But in Wales, it's absolutely the centre of gravity around sport. And so if you think about how the Welsh rugby public view with the Welsh rugby team, if they win it absolutely changes the mindset of Wales, the population, how they feel about things. And, and we're talking about winning a game, one game. If they go and win a Grand Slam or they win a championship, that will define mentality. And the spend alone in Cardiff is material. It literally will translate to tens and tens of millions of pounds on one match day, because 85,000 people turn up in Cardiff and spend an entire weekend in Cardiff. So from the local economy perspective, the Welsh government is meaningful. The Welsh professional rugby team, the national team is huge. And and um, basically I own and run one of four teams. So where it's unique is it's quite small as a professional industry. You have the Welsh national team at the top and then you have four professional teams that sit underneath and the players from those four teams feed into and are picked to play for the Wales. The best of those four teams will represent Wales. 
Uh, in England, you obviously have 12 professional teams. It's now 10 because two went bust last year. But the, 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 And the England team is picked there from a broader base. But Wales is a small base from which to pick. Why is that not a good business decision? Then? I remember Manoj Badali, actually, who we had on the show, who owns Rajasthan Royals in the IPL. He mm-hmm. said one of the things he looks for is a finite supply of teams where it doesn't change in terms of the league structure of going up and down and because that kind of cements value in the club. Given there's only four and the stars of those teams play on an international level, mm-hmm. isn't it actually a really good business decision buying these te- one of these teams? Well, it depends, isn't it? And it depends on this. It's how the game is governed. So if you think about how the IPL is governed, yeah. it's very strictly governed, and there's a strict spend, and it's driven by the owners, and therefore they can make a return, and the brands uh, can be very valuable. A bit like the NBA or a bit like the NFL. But in rugby, as that European mentality, which has historically been, whatever the owner of that team is willing to spend within reason, the team can spend, which of course can make a team competitive on the field. But the second, and you've seen it last year in England where obviously two teams have gone into insolvency, the second those owners then step away, actually they're not businesses as such, uh, robust businesses. They're actually businesses that depend or historically depend on the goodwill of the owner to basically write a check every year to be competitive. They're not built around the principles of NFL or the IPL or the NBA, which is actually we're going to create value in the brand, we're going to create value in the franchise, we create value in the league, and we do that by having strict spend rules and budgets, which actually mean that all the teams become sustainable and then over time therefore become highly valuable. Whereas in Europe and certainly in rugby in Wales, historically owners have spent money and you get caught up because everyone's competitive business people who tend to own these teams are competitive people by nature so they'll always want to get the best next player to win a bit like premier league right so you know and as a result of that finances into sport can be really tricky and historically have been tricky literally you saw two teams last year in england go bust off the back of the owners literally walking away yeah when you look at then the kind of structures around the league that it comes into the champ- rugby championship and then you bring you know teams from ireland teams from wales teams from south africa all together then to play this is that not a sophistication or at least a breadth like a super in, league yeah it's a super league which is what happens at the moment it's where dragons play as part of you know this team of well, this league of 12 yeah coming from all these different countries yeah that is that is creating a product that you could build value off or it, not it, it could yeah and it could be so much better so much quicker so the probably the the entrepreneurs in you and the business person in us would be frustrated by rugby governs itself why, why do i say that it's way too slow to make the changes it needs to make in order to become exactly what you described. There's nothing stopping it. If you think about rugby as a product, as a product, it's probably one of the last gladiatorial sports you can go and see where you go in an arena and you watch 30 people genuinely hammer and tong at each other um, with some technical skill around ball and movement and passing and shape. If you go watch England and Wales at Twickenham in a few weeks' time, that is a blood, you know, exciting guts. It's a real genuinely, you know, there's not many gladiatorial sports left. And this one is still is, albeit obviously there's a bit like the NFL now. It's having to govern itself a lot more carefully around, obviously, things like concussion and all that to future-proof itself. There's some really important debates happening there. But the reality of that is... You, I would be far quicker to make changes rugby needs to make around the governance of it. So you should, of course, have strict rules around spending. The game should try and elevate itself and work together to get better broadcasting deals. You should have promotion and relegation. I think all great sport has jeopardy, which for me is promotion and relegation. I don't like sports that don't, and I think rugby should embrace that. Sorry, I, 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 so do I. I just want to kind of deconstruct those things there. Like you said about kind of the caps on spending. We don't see the vast transfer budgets in rugby like we do in other sports we don't see the vast wages is there uncontrollable spending by owners in rugby that's causing this co- relatively yes so there is so the top players will probably be earning like if you go to france they'll be in a million quid a year some of the top players yeah. but if you look at what underpins that the revenues of those business on a standalone basis wouldn't support that kind of wage uh, so level. they're being subsidized by so the they're owners. being subsidized by the owners that's the reality of it and those owners are french businessmen the, Often, or the, in the UK, you've got people who own Bath. Um, um, historically, Saracens is probably your most famous one. Um, so those, pe- yeah. So, so the, the clubs are owned by wealthy people. So in England, you'd split it between, I would say, three or four. Uh, billionaires, um, multi, multi, or multi, 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 multi millionaires, and then probably three or four teams which are the have-nots. Yeah. So there's kind of a there's a genuine split. Uh-huh. Um, um, so I think for the game, I would revolutionize much quicker some of the things like the product 
be far more disciplined around you know what these teams can spend revenue to wage ratio is probably the right way to go because mm. if you have revenue to wage ratio you can spend i don't know let's call it 70 percent of your revenue on player squad size then that forces by definition some discipline i.e you've got to grow your revenue to become more competitive on the field you can put some money in potentially as an owner to try and drive that revenue growth like manchester city did over the last 10 years you can do that but you've got to do it the right way around are these businesses run or are these clubs run by good business owners who drive revenue who drive efficiency who drive top line like you run businesses are these clubs structured and have the mindset of growing top line revenue in that way i would say historically it's been a mix bag. I mean, the club I bought was insolvent in 2016, right? So the, that tells you something. How much did you buy it for? So this year, we're having to put two million in just this year that we're in, in order to stabilize the finances. Over the next years, I would imagine it's going to be, you know, um, several million. And uh, we means the owners, right? As yeah, the said, owners. Is... Yeah, and that's what we're going to have to. And the risk that sits beneath it, right? Because if COVID comes, yeah. let's not forget, if COVID comes, you're taking all the risk. And in rugby, broadcast revenues are about 25% of turnover, maybe 20% of turnover. So the spectators are critical. So it's almost the opposite of football. Remember, football had empty stadiums, like football was, I was like, well, it doesn't bother. We can still play and we'll still be sustainable. So what does football look like? Just it's the opposite. Yeah. It's the opposite. But it's as the opposite as way as around. In, you're right, the point there is that, you know, football has its empty stadiums. Their match day revenue compared to the revenue they generate elsewhere, yeah. it's not it's not a huge drive. It's still important. And you're starting to see that now. The the Money League, I think they've released recently, Spurs just overtook Chelsea in it. Now that's by no means insignificant and massively related to the fact they've now got a fully operational stadium that can drive really great match day revenues. But that is still a business that can last without the in-stadium fans or the rugby. Yeah. No, I get you. Where rugby slows though is on governance, right? So if you want to see the product, you'd never put up with it in an investment or in a boardroom. Like, are you mad? And what I mean by this very specifically, right? Think about promotion relegation, think about broadcasters. What do they want? If you ask yourself that question, what would they say? They would say, we want exciting fixtures, the top and bottom of the league. We want jeopardy, top and bottom of the league to the end. Um, and you want fixtures that over time, therefore, become meaningful every given Saturday, which is why the Premier League is a brilliant product, because let's not forget relegation games are as exciting as Liverpool, Manchester City games, because there's real jeopardy on the end of them. And what rugby has is historic almost, I wouldn't call it a, uh, it's very conservative. So they have this thing where the teams, is, if you look at the English League as an example, there's 10 teams and you basically can't get, it's, you won't get relegated out of it that 10 teams and you equally can't break into it very easily. That's what Manoj said on the show, which is that creates a premium on those clubs because then you know that there's security. Yeah. In yeah. Terms if we're of American or if we're in India, I'd agree with you, but we're in Europe and I think in the UK, especially in sport, we have a history promotion relegation and our supporters like it, broadcasters like it, I like it. There should be risk. I wonder if a team is at the bottom of the league yeah. They should get relegated and they can fight their way back up. And I think that'll really drive engagement with the product. Uh, not this you know, sort of closed shop where the meaningful fixtures come at the back end of a season and you can lose a few games, it doesn't matter. I, I, I just don't like that concept. But can we, like, can we look at the NBA and the NFL and, 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 and talk about how well they do within the sporting structures and then talk about wanting open leagues? Because let's be, let's be really honest, right? The reason they can drive such valuable numbers is because you know, let's say from a commercial perspective, you can sign a five-year deal with that team and you know that they're still going to be competing in that league. You sign a five-year commercial contract for X million with a rugby club or a football team at the moment that could, in three seasons, drop down three leagues. Yeah. Your value completely diminishes in that deal. Yeah. So can you have both? Is it a contradiction? Yeah, I think it is. I think US supporters, if you go to the US sports, they accept that model. And and they're and they're and they're good with that model. I I, I don't think you can. I, I I'm I'm in for the risk. Mm. If I do a rubbish job and I do a crap job running the dragons and we we get relegated down two three divisions, well then we deserve what we had coming to us, and we should do better, right? And but that jeopardy I think drives the engagement and excitement of supporters and broadcasters, and in the end that's what drives the revenue. We're in an entertainment business in the end. That's what we are. You know, we're not a closed shop of franchise run. I don't even like the phrase is franchise run. It's, it, it sort of grates at me a little bit. I don't even like the concept. I understand the value of a brand, but I don't want like franchise sport. I want sport that connects the communities that they're in. Because I think that's the history of you. We have sports teams which connect to the, you know, the communities they sit in. And those supporters want to engage in games where actually on any given Saturday, they know win and loss mean something. I love watching the NBA, but they play like, how many games and I can go I know I can go watch a game at the Brooklyn Nets and that night the players like mm, doesn't really matter if we lose this one 
and, and I think there's something there's something wrong about that. But especially in a gladiatorial sport like rugby, every game is I would have less games and higher quality games, but every game means something, has something hanging off the back of it. And I would move everything out of the way around rugby politics in order to make that happen. Okay. So I would, for example, if you think about the English league, the Welsh, we play in the league called the URC. You have the English league with 10 teams and we have the four South African teams, we have the four Irish teams, the two Scottish teams, the four Welsh teams and the two Irish teams in our league. Wouldn't it be amazing? CVC invest in both leagues. So CVC are major shareholders in the English league and also our league, as well as the Six Nations. I think it'd be amazing if CVC went, listen, let's put these leagues together, create two leagues, premiership, championship, up and down, promotion, relegation, and have a cross-border competition where we all literally went at it hammer and tongs and created a really intense rugby season around that. And I think supporters and broadcasters would love it personally. It's a discussion that is, we have to have it. Yeah. Because it, you're talking about the sustainability of a massively historical and well-backed sport. But at the moment, we're having a conversation earlier, which goes, is rugby still relevant? And I mean that provocatively. Yeah, yeah. And I really do. Because I didn't expect you to ask the, that question. That was yeah, me. No, but, yeah. but, but, but for the competition now, for eyes, for media, for attention, how do we, how do have, we retain relevance? Well, I think to me, that's leadership of the game. You have to keep it relevant. Nothing has a divine right to stay relevant, whether you're a company or a sports team. You know, it has a divine right to stay relevant. You have to be bloody good at what you do. We're fighting with the entertainment and leisure pound, which is a very competitive pound. It's never been more competitive. The days of like, you know, 70,000 people turning up, you know, to watch a rugby game on a Saturday, like in the 1920s, when that, that Saturday afternoon was the only thing probably in that community you could do for entertainment. Those days are gone, right? So we have a huge amount. We have a work in a very competitive industry for that leisure pound. And we should think about ourselves that way and therefore move everything out of the way to make the product as good as it can be. And I think that goes back to what I'm saying around the, you know, if you talk about the health and safety, you know, my son plays for a rugby team and he's 12 years old and this season the, the first lad got knocked out concussed and his mum said he's not playing rugby anymore. So this is a real issue for rugby, right? This is parents, understand, we're watching their son play, he's 12 years old, he got accidentally got on either side of the head, he's concussed and his mum, I was watching the game, uh, his mum was like, understand, he's not playing in rugby anymore, my son. And so rugby, of course, has to tackle this. It's a huge issue, but of course it can. But the NFL's wrestled it down. They wrestle concussion down in the US. We can, of course, do the same in rugby. Rugby's done some really good stuff around tackle height, for example. So it's, it, is ta it is dealing with it. But I think push for, get yourself on the front foot as a game. Get the best technology available, because we all know there's great ways to measure concussion now through gum shields and lots of other technology that's out there. Let's make sure there's great player welfare post-career so that we take care of players who have issues. And let's just get on with it, because there's a brilliant game and um, if as a game to play and as a game to watch honestly personally for me I, there's no game like it when it's done well like if any of you watch the france and uh, new zealand game yeah. in the world cup that was probably the best sporting event in terms of uh, experience to watch a sport that i've seen in the last 12 18 months of any sport it's brilliant i think life is about packaging whether you're raising a fund or whether you're selling a product, it is always about packaging. And bluntly, I think rugby's just packaged shitly. You know, when you look at bluntly short form video, short form video and sport in particular, sport and football and cricket uh, are done incredibly well across TikTok in particular, when we think about inspiring young audiences. I don't think rugby is packaged in the right and exciting way. You know, Drive to Survive reinvigorated a whole industry of F1 beyond belief. Yeah. yeah. Rugby doesn't have any packaging. It's just like... So this is perfect timing to have this conversation because the Netflix Six Nations series just comes yep. out now. And it's, you know, the similar type of model, right? It's the behind the scenes documentary series bringing light and personality and relevance to what goes on, not just on the pitch, but the stories of the people that make it happen. But it's the same model now that we're just putting into yeah, rugby. Yeah, but rugby's now the 10th the, the sport to do it. Uh, you've got to be the first. And to do that, you've got to be willing to take risk. And the trouble with the game is it's run by people, frankly, who are too corporate in their outlook. And I think when you build businesses and entrepreneurs- What are they optimizing for? They're corporate? optimizing for their own careers, as, as what I believe. And I think they, and I see it. I've sat in the boardrooms, I've watched the people, I've watched the profile, and I get it, you know, because if you're in, a, you know, you can earn a good living as an off-field administrator, as a rugby off-field administrator, you'll be in a significant six-figure salary, right? And, but what that breeds, I think, is a lethargy. And you don't, and you think about your own personal career and what's my next move in rugby or what's my next move in sport. I don't care about that. I never cared about that. I care about building things. And if I, if I do a bad job and I get sacked or it fails, all right, at least I, I had a go, right? This is the issue with it. So what I would do, I would encourage anyone who's investing in rugby, if it's CVC or anyone, to rip up that mentality and say, look, we can't go slow 
around this. There's too much competition. The game has too many challenges. It could be so much better from a product perspective. Let's cut through some of these issues, have a higher appetite for risk, move much quicker, and let people go into leadership positions who are willing to take some risk and revolutionize the game. Because if we're just going to roll forward with more of the same model, and you know, and, and of course, if you're in a job where you've got a pension and a mortgage and you think with the next five, 10 years of your career, the last thing you're going to do is do something revolutionary because you get sacked for that. Yeah, That's 100%. what you get sacked for. But if you make another mm, incremental decision which marginally moves the ball, you never get sacked yeah. for that. But that means you're dying, in my opinion. You're going nowhere fast. David, you're an entrepreneur. You fix problems, okay? How do you fix this problem? Now? And I, I mean this in a nice way. Instead of like uh, analyzing from an ownership perspective, mm. Is there a way to rebuild it ourselves? Is there a way to actually take a very proactive role in ensuring that mindset changes? How do you think about like, I'm gonna help solve this problem? You know, I think it goes back to people. If I think about the best people that, what well, they've built in, it, it goes back to getting, I think a small team, relatively small team, with people who, who have a real passion for building it, and CVC, of course, as a major owner, should be driving these conversations. I would get those people in a room and say, look, these are the three, four big problems this game is facing. What are the what are the big things we think this, well, what could this game look like? Because rugby could be genuinely a huge sport from a broadcast perspective and much bigger commercially, because yeah. there's not many sports like it. If you go back to my sort of analogy of gladiatorial sport, exciting to watch. You know, jeopardy right to the end of the game normally. Short Most games enough. are tight. Short enough. It's over in like an hour and a half, yeah, two yeah. hours. It's quick. Quick. It's exactly. Quick. It's exciting. So so if you if you if you had a product like that, you would surely get in a room and say, look, let's cut out all the bureaucracy and, and administrative politics around um, the lethargy of decision making. And let's as a group of, I don't know, six, seven, eight people who, who, are, who have influence in the game, let's make some really big, bold decisions and take the risk off the people who are frankly not willing to take that risk. And then get on with it and give it a go. And it, why, what, you know, I always go back to the life of Brian thing, you know, uh, not in a flippant way, but if I think about businesses, like I started with nothing, if I end with nothing, what have I lost? Nothing. And if you if you at least have that as a little frame of reference somewhere in your decision making, I think it liberates you to try and do great things. It might mean you fall flat in your face, but at least you've had a go, right? Yeah. And I think rugby's too busy noodling forward slowly. CBC have put a lot of money in. Yeah, they have. Why would they put money in if they're not trying to do something like this? Because you don't want to just <laughs> find the sustainability in the sport that, as you highlighted, has its struggles. Surely this is on their agenda. They should be at yeah. the table doing this. I can't imagine it's not. I think probably like with most investments, you can perhaps from the external looking in, I think, again, a CVC investor obviously did Formula One as well. So they understand sport. They're brilliant investors. They have obviously significant funds. They, I think the probably what, what, what like you do in any investment, sometimes you underestimate the inertia to drive the change that you might think from the outside looking in. This feels obvious. I mean, how many businesses we want to go, oh, it seems obvious, but like then try and make people do it. It's not I, always I would easy. love to know the check size that they put into it. And then I'd love to know what percent that is as a portion of their fund. Because my bet is their return on F1 will so dwarf anything that it will ever make in rugby, respectfully, I think. And I think they'll probably agree with me there that let's just concentrate our resources and our effort towards that rugby is less of a priority so you think now it's become like a it, it's a rounding hour you can lose the 200 300 million on that because we've just made four billion on f1 it doesn't matter and you are taught to concentrate your efforts and your resources yeah. on the winners it doesn't mean it's forgotten but you're not going to uproot an industry cause turmoil with execs potentially create troubling situations for cvc's brand where you are upholding or changing a whole structure because then every other sports industry will go we don't want cvc in ours because look what they did to them not worth it 300 million games so, so harry's almost verbatim said what i said to, to in the boardrooms of welsh rugby over the last year or two and you have to make yourself relevant to the investor by showing that you as an industry can drive the change required no one is going to drive that rugby has to want to do it for themselves so those people charged with the responsibility of driving that change i think need to do it and um you know, or, you, or get out of the way can you talk a little bit just i really want to make this like accessible for people because so much of the conversation around rugby and why it's not working i always feel like that we just go in and assume everyone knows and understands what's already there but we talked about governance you have quite good exposure at the moment to some of the governance but as you're saying you're struggling to even have these conversations and make them heard what welsh rugby union rfu world rugby how does it all fit together yeah so if you think about it so each governing body uh, is independent 
Um, so they're not they're not connected. But what they all have, for example, is an equal stake in the Six Nations. So the RFU, the SRU, the IRFU, the WIU, the French Federation, the Italian, they all have a vested interest in that tournament. CVC have invested into that tournament. So in effect, CVC is now a shareholder of the Six Nations alongside a sh- as a, the WIU is a shareholder in the Six Nations. So they've all taken a bit of dilution to take, obviously, CVC's capital to try and grow the game and brought CVC in to help do a bit like uh, the man at United, United uh, Jim Ratcliffe's just done to run, help run the commercial part of growing rugby. So that's how the game is structured from an ownership. It's very old-fashioned in that sense. And where does World Rugby fit in? So World Rugby governs the game globally. So their their big event would be the World Cup every four years. That's their big revenue driver. So as long as that keeps driving in the revenues and performing, then they've got a significant sort of cash cow in effect called the Rugby World Cup, which is every four years. Um, I think the most financially successful one was the England one in 2015, because no surprise. Where rugby is hugely successful is at international level. So where does the model work really well? It's at international level. So when England plays Scotland, there's 90,000 at Twickenham. Those games generate a hell of a lot of money. Broadcasters love them. It's, it's like a, cricket. It, exactly. There we go. So it, so where's your challenge? Your challenge is not there for, as an executive running the RFU or the WIU, you, of course you should optimise those occasions. But no one should be pleased with their performance that international rugby is a financial success. International rugby is a no-brainer. Those games are culturally, historically, traditionally relevant to their support as they generate huge interest in their support bases. They're countries against countries. There's a natural rivalry, England and Wales, Ireland and England. It's a natural rivalry. It's like selling candy to a baby, right? So no one should be rewarded for that. That's like that's like 101 um, where rugby is, has challenges at the club level. So some clubs have really good support bases, but actually, if you look generally at the club game level, the game is significantly smaller. Now, compare that to football. International football and club football, the Premier League, the Premier League is a huge product, cricket, the IPL. So they've grown that the last, what, 10 years, the IPL? Rugby needs to look at that and go, how the hell do we get the club game up and off its knees and to that closer to the international game in terms of experience, product, and revenue. And the way you do it is less games, higher quality games, and have a brilliant level of jeopardy in every occasion. Then you'll grow. But dis- you won't grow without it. I disagree. Go on. I disagree. You know what? The best product doesn't always sell. You need a great go-to-market. And actually, decent products with amazing go-to-markets distribution sell much better. And so higher quality games, less of them, great. You get, you know, good numbers, local numbers, fine. But actually, Ryan Reynolds, really effective multi-channel distribution, repackaged media is how you get millions. That's how you get global fan bases. That's how you get true sponsorships with Delta, with Starbucks, with Chase Bank, you name it. You need distribution more than you need better product. The product itself is good enough. You need much, much more innovative ways to think about how we cut up this content for multi-channel. As you said, you're an entertainment company. Think of it like Disney, not like a sports. Yeah, the tournament structure right now isn't fit for purpose for that. So you create that jeopardy. You create that environment where you bring the leagues together, you bring Premiership Rugby together with the Rugby Championship. You create those two. You have the jeopardy in a promotion and relegation system from all different countries that are participating in this. You can package that, you can distribute that, and you can sell that really effectively. I, listen, I 100% agree that that would be additional and good, but I think primarily distribution needs to be handled first, and that's more important. I think Aaron makes a really interesting point. You should you should come and run rugby somewhere. No, but I know you're busy. But, um, the, the, no, but I think the distribution. But also, do you know what's so, I'm so sorry to interrupt yeah, you, but you know what's fascinating is really a trend in micro influencers around what I eat in a day, which is fascinating. These have millions and millions and millions of followers. Jim Shots uh, ambassador and community program is one of the largest and the fastest growing. We should see the personalization and celebritization of these players. These players have fascinating training routines. They have incredible diets, they have incredible workouts. Why are they not documenting, diarizing them on Instagram? You would have gym shop community members orgasming over the incredible <laughs> training yeah. routines that come out of these clubs. I would love to follow it. But you know why? The truth of that is in rugby, there's a culture of players. Um, where if you're a player, you don't get too, not big for your boots, but you know what I mean? You're part of a team and the team comes first. So there's a mentality of the teams first, um, and you know, you almost if in a dress room, of course you have characters and personalities, but there's not a culture of what you just described. It's not like the NFL like that. And I think you're right though. I think 
but this is back to getting the right people in the room and pushing rugby and really driving it because I think where you get to is exactly that. We've got some amazing, I mean, honestly, just in our dressing room, there's some real characters. Yeah. You know, they, they would be incredibly watchable, you know, controversial, likable, some absolute unbelievably disciplined athletes with incredible stories around their diets, et cetera, and yeah. their regime. So you're right, that, but rugby's got to embrace that and get that out there. But, you know, you could drive that. If, if the issue, your blocker there, like you just said, is... It's, uh, it's it's a team, right? it's a collective. So we don't want to necessarily have the same individual piece because it's uh, it's us all together or no one, right? If that's driven centrally, let's say by Dragons, you can start still building the personal profiles, but you still drive it from the centralized team. So you don't feel like it's an independent piece where people are getting you know more attention than others. You're creating the same attraction. It's just slightly differently packaged. Because I've been in the game for a few years now, you do get a little bit institutionalized. And it's interesting to have that provocation because as I reflect on it now, I think when I first got involved in the game, I was definitely probably there. And then you get, in, oh, it's a team sport. And But actually, perhaps the reason why it hasn't changed enough is because it's not broke enough. Because the international game financially, in effect, supports the club game. Mm -hmm. And rugby, therefore, is this stable, and sport has very stable revenues. Actually, it's a very investable business. Like every other Dragons will turn over between 11 and a half and 12 and a half million, depending on how we do. So you can, you can almost set your watch by it. It's growing a bit. It's growing every year a bit, a bit more than inflation. It can probably grow a lot quicker if we talk about things. We, but it's a pretty stable business model. So you can invest in that. It's not like every year it varies other than COVID. So... Given that, why would you not therefore go and do some of these things and test them? Because that's how you could drive some exponential growth around you. And I think the answer sits in, it's just not broke enough because the international game generates so much money that if rugby was a bit more financially broken, you'd have to do these things. Yeah. And of course, it's probably not broken enough and therefore it's got this horrible sort of status quo nerdling forward. It's broke for wasps, it's broke for London yeah, Irish. But, but, yeah, but it's breaking. Every, everyone, it's breaking. Says, everyone says, you know, every business is becoming a content business. And this is what I find astounding when you say about those revenues. If the Dragons is a content business, how would we restructure our all shot? You would have a head of production, you would have a head of TikTok, you would have a head of Instagram Reels. You would absolutely take the content to each channel. Yeah. But the problem is, and this is where I'm really interested in it from your perspective, because you're talking about the people that are governing the game, right? The, I'm, I'm pretty, pretty sure this kind of stuff doesn't come up within those boardrooms. But I think if you if you build those media powerhouses, you actually have so much more leverage in those boardrooms. If you become the dominant club in that league to such an extent that you have a very large US audience, you have millions of followers following each individual player, you have the celebritization of those players. When you walk in and say, listen, we want this change. We are throwing lots of stuff around. Mm. Number one, yeah. right, that you can actually affect change as an owner now of a club, an independent for the first time, right? Yeah. Within Wales. Yeah. First thing, what do we do? Well, I think you've got to start with, you, you, I think you can't, well, I like about what Harry's saying is, if you think of the things I was saying, you have to influence CVC, the league, the governing bodies, and hope they're going to do some of those things, right, to change the product. I think there's an appetite to change some of them because they get it, but that takes time. And that's a longer play. And you always go back to what can I, what can you control? Because that's what you can change. So I think the celebritization of players is massive. We've actually spoken about it at our club. Like, how do you make some of the guys famous? Have this guy Rio Dyer. He's one of the young Welsh internationals. Incredible player. Incredibly marketable. Super talented guy. So I think the celebritization of players is definitely where you need to go. If you look at the Wrexham example, you know, talking about a non-league football team, Netflix, you, know, you touched on it. You know, if you think about that content and distribution. Well, that's a great example of the product did not change, but the packaging and the go-to-market distribution yeah, did, did. And that created millions and millions and millions in pounds and audience. Yeah, yeah it did. Yeah. But I'm again, like yeah. you know, they could affect very little when it came down to how the league functioned. If you watched Welcome to Wrexham, right, you had two teams that got record amounts of points both should automatically have gone up. The complaints within the structure were, oh, you know, only one is automatically promoted. You have the best season ever and you're going into playoffs where you may not qualify. They had loads of gripes with the structures of the league. What did they do? They worked with the things they could control. So that's, that was more my question is, we governance piece is an issue, but you, you're an owner now. You've got control of a club. And that mm. club, if it's not going to centrally change, can independently start doing things that influence outside of where mm. it's operating. But it's very difficult to just build a media company. And so I think these you know, clubs aren't set up to just become media businesses tomorrow. I think you need to hire people from media yeah. and turn into full entertainment houses. Which is, if you look at, I guess to some extent, your example is a good one because that's what Premier League football's doing. If you look, if you look at like how, how Tottenham positions itself now, it's like a media and content business. I right? watched Tottenham TikToks where this, like, I think like a 22 year old like young person in the marketing team just has stands outside the lift and says, who's the most famous person in your contacts? They get 
10, 12, 14 million views per video. Each player has become celebrities again in their own right. It's really cool and interesting. If you went across the IRFU, the Welsh Rugby Union, the SIU and the RFU and said how many media and content people of what you just discussed, I think there's hardly, they'd be, they'd be hugely under-resourced relative to the size of the product they've got. And, and the celebritization of players actually takes pressure off the financials of the club in what we said earlier about the revenue to wage ratio. Because when you actually look at your Gymshark, your Maxi Muscle, your My Protein, some of the biggest providers of large sponsorships to all health, nutrition influencers, they would actually supplement a lot of the financial requirements of players with sponsorship deals when they have growing audiences. You mentioned Rio Dyer, I think you mentioned. Yeah. You know, if he has a 100 grand My protein deal where he's actually just doing a day in the life of Rio, yeah. training routines, protein yeah. intake. Suddenly yeah. that's actually a little bit less pressure for you as an owner and it could relieve some of that burden. Yeah, uh, the, the lucky thing for us, we're in quite a good position. So one, one of my co-owners is a guy uh, called Ho Young, and, and he uh, he's a, one of the um, one of the owners of the Miami Marlins in the in the obviously the uh, the National Baseball League. And what shocked him, he looked at rugby, was how little content was produced around players, because yeah. of course everything around American sport is about the individual. Every team, it doesn't matter how big like you know mm -hmm. the Lakers are. It's still about, it was about Kobe. <laughs> it's it's about, you know, it's about those individuals, the star of the team, if you like. So of course, and the same is true in most American sports, because in the end, that's who people connect I think, to. I think it's actually, sorry, it's society today. In the movie, it's the Leonardo DiCaprio movie. In Venture Capital, it's the, you name it, star of that fund. There's always the star investor. Yeah. It, we live in a star-driven culture. Yep. Can, yeah. can I just dive in on, on some of the numbers? You mentioned earlier kind of 12 million in yeah. revenue. Mm. How does that break up in terms of where the money comes from? So it's 75% ticket receipts from sales? No, so where it breaks up is about 20, 25% is broadcast. Does it come in one lump sum? Is no. it paid throughout the year? Pay throughout the year. And 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 subject to you know how far you can go in certain tournaments, etc. So you you can get extra money. So if you win the league, of course you get bonuses. Yeah. Um, so that's are like the bonuses material. Yeah, they can be. Yeah, because if you imagine if you like when Leinster, who's like the Manchester City of the league, right? Yeah. When they played the semi-finals, they moved it from their ground, which holds about fifteen thousand people, and played in Ireland's national stadium, and they had seventy thousand people there. That one game, I think, it generated a million euros just 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 that one game so for them and of course so there is this and that's just the gate <laughs> so if you get it right if then you have broadcast on top there's prize money so yeah if you, if you become successful there's a there's a there's a really good there's a really sensible sustainable sports business model that sits beneath rugby but you have got to grow and you've got to be, be successful what about the commercials then so the partnerships that you have with a lot of the brands how do they drive that in accordance with the numbers that you're bringing in from yeah so we, we are we're about two and a half million quid comes from commercial sponsorships of the 12. And what do they want when they're partnering with you? Do you sit down with them at the start of the season? Yeah, it's, you it's normally one of two things. One is they either one profile for their brand, so the broadcast, of course, because um, obviously we're in broadcast across four countries, including South Africa. On top of that, they normally, and this is why it's one of two things, they normally like some sort of community element. Because one of the brilliant things about, especially where we are in Wales, where it's the national sport, so where our team represents Gwent, um, where there's probably, you know, five, six, 550, 600,000 people live. Um, it's the major sport in that area. We have over 75 clubs that just play rugby in Gwent. So wow. it's a, in the heart of the community. It's huge. So they want to do some sort of community CSR kind of reach out. Sometimes the businesses might have a presence in South Wales. So it makes sense for them to have a CSR program around South Wales, for example. So there's normally one of two ideas, the brand angle, and then there's the community angle. That's how I'd paraphrase the sponsorship conversations we've had. So if you think about it, so let's go 20%, 25% comes of broadcast, 15, 20% will come from commercial sponsorships. And then about, mm, but just over 20% will can come from, you know, spectators, hospitality, match day revenues, let's call it that, mm -hmm. bar take, etc. all the things that go on around a stadium on a match day. And then the last sort of piece of the pie, the last 20, 25% will come from funding that you get for providing players to the national team. Huh. So though obviously when, you, when, the, when our lads get picked for Wales, of course, the Welsh national team then, in effect, have paid us historically to have access to those players because we contract them. Yeah. So there's some money that the funding would come from um, pay, paying for access to our product, which is our players. So there's some other further funding that comes from the governing body. Do you body. think they pay in accordance to the value that they get? And if that's that small, 10 to 15 percent or whatever that yeah, number you, you said, 10 to 15 20 percent. OK, 20 percent. But given bluntly the revenues that they're generating and the global 
access that they're receiving with your players that you're training and you're nurturing, should that not be a little bit higher? If you think about it from a business perspective, um, I think historically there's been times actually with us being an overinvestment relative to actually um, the value you bring. Yeah, so of but course, we would, no, of course we should. Of course, we would argue we need to have more. But if I think about the players we pr provide, we should, as a club, we should be providing more because we have the most clubs in our area in Gwent. So if we get our pathway and development pathway right, yeah. we should be getting more money. So that's why I say more. We should be providing more. In Wales, it was on a per player basis, in effect, because in effect, what the union would do if a player got picked for Wales, they would pick up 80% 80, 80 of the cost of that player, and that's how the model works. How much does a rugby player get paid? I know it's variable, but. It what does that look like? So the best players in France can get, you know, if you imagine if you're a top, top international player, you're probably earning somewhere between, in it, just, you know, salary, forget sponsorship and endorsements. You're probably earning a top players between sort of 400K to a million euros. So someone like a Finn Russell at Bath, I think it was publicised, or, or the, um, if you look at, who else is a good example? If you look at Owen Farrell, who's just moved from Saracens, um, to France, he's probably earning somewhere between salary 800 to a million pounds a year, something like that. And then, of course, they get appearance money, win bonuses, sponsorships. So the, the top players, the top players make a very good living. And what but that's not the, of course, what, the, what, what are the, the wage average. budgets? Like, not not the what, what are the wage budgets of these clubs? So at, at our club, our wage budget would be around four and a half to five million a year. Four and a half to five million a year. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Wow. And but, so the average players like two fifty. If you did the average, we'd have about 40 players in a squad. Because, of course, rugby is a nutritional sport. So at any one time, around 20% of players are injured. 15 to 20% of players are injured at any given time. God. So if we just, like, throw some ideas at the wall here. Is this a sport where you can yield cash as a weapon? If I just said, hey, I have a backer and we have unlimited funds, we can get Farrell, we can get the star players, we can get the best so can you saudi pro league it basically yeah can we saudi pro league it and just buy this and build incredible experiences with star players yeah you can do that um so uh, you can definitely do that so we have things in rugby we have a thing called marquee players so you have like even if your salary cap in wales was four and a half or five million the reality is you could still probably go and lobby and say i want a marquee player so if you wanted as long as you as owner said i'm going to underwrite the financial risk of this guy over the next three years you could definitely go and have those conversations and you can definitely do that there's nothing there's nothing the league would welcome it frankly i would imagine I mean, it's a good thing for the game right so there's nothing stopping you what are your views on Owen farrell leaving how does that impact the the kind of leagues when you're losing top stars and you're still trying to grow and and kind of develop the game within Premiership rugby? I think um, I think when you lose top players is always bad for a league. Um, Owen Farrell's probably the, for me he's been the best players of a generation in the last ten years, certainly for England. It's good for France, right? It's good for the player. The, you can't blame the player. <laughs> Blame the player because he's playing rugby week in week out. It's a tough sport, so I uh, think good luck to Owen. Um, but I think for the league, yeah, you want to be keeping your best players because in the end, why do people turn up? What's the market? And well, it's because you want to see the superstars, and rightly that's where France, I think, and the French league has stolen a bit of a march because they are willing to invest those sort of sums of money, and they've got owners who can who can do it. Again, you're an entrepreneur. <laughs> Like, I get you on CVC and the weight and influence that they have. Again, going back to what we said about where it probably sits in their portfolios, when you look at their portfolios and the proportion of dollars that they have in to the proportion of dollars that will potentially return, they will probably now sell that at a discount. They'll probably just be happy with their money back. We've got to that stage in the cycle. You're an entrepreneur, David. Like, why would one not go, hmm, there's an opportunity here to buy that at a discount, which would probably be a pretty decent price. And actually, one could actually implement change top down as well. Yeah, I think I think that is where the opportunity sits. So you're absolutely right. I, I would go if you could get um, su sufficient control of the boardroom that runs rugby. Yeah. And remember, CVC have commercial control of rugby. Mm. They have commercial control um, as part of their investment, a bit like they did with F1. The reason I'm smiling a bit is because you've got to be able to influence still the governing bodies to want to do. I think two big things. One, you need a global season. What does that mean? It means you can play uh, all the big fixtures without overlapping. So give you, bring that to life. Sometimes we'll play a game when Wales are playing England, which devalues the club game, right? Mm -hmm. Rugby needs to stop that nonsense so that every fixture matters and the best players are available for every yeah. fixture, right? That's the first thing. And then I think the second thing you'd do is you'd force the culture change around how you create the product around content and invest far more, far, significantly more money in, in the future of that because that is where, 
you know, there are some amazing personalities. Rugby players, are, there's some genuinely real characters. I'm even smart as I think some of the guys I know. There's some proper, brilliantly marketable characters in rugby um, who are actually still relatable. The re rugby players are still relatable because even the top players are earning good money. But it's not like a footballer who's earning like it completely out of touch with the average bloke in the street. You know, lots of rugby players are still very relatable. So by definition, it makes them hugely marketable and gives you a bit of an advantage in marketing them. How much did CVC invest? Uh, in in our league alone, over a hundred million. Okay, so a hundred million. Just in our league, but if you do the combined, they've probably invested half a billion. Okay, across rugby. Yeah, but you could. Probably, but your point is relevant. You could buy your that. Point I'm is sure relevant. you could buy that at a discount. I'm sure they'd take the money back now. Liquidity is scarce, and then that would give you that top down seat. When you say you, you mean what? Like a group group of the owners coming together now with this kind of collective idea. You're not going to do it individually. Like how do you, how how do you bring the right group of people together to actually start implementing this? Because when CVC come in, you're you're thinking positively. You're thinking this is great. This is a huge amount of investment in a league that really needs it, and we can now leverage. I to think the next to level. get to get conviction as an investor, you've got to believe that you can definitely change the game. You've got to believe that the points that Harry's made around how you change content, change culture around celebritization. Uh, you've got to believe that you can drive that. If you can drive that, I think Harry's absolutely right. There's a bit of a no-brainer of an investment. I think in CVC would say, if you can drive that, we'll stay. We'll, but we're all in for that because that's where we think we can yeah. make good returns. But you've <laughs> got to be willing to run yeah. for CVC. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but like, if you actually look at the benchmark value of other leagues and other sports versus rugby, I say every other league and every other sports hit this asymptote point of value creation. Where you're, I, don't, I think football is not going to accrete more value from where clubs are being purchase today you can argue with me here but i think 2024 will be the year where you see the plateauing of club value and i think actually the most opportunity for value accretion is actually in rugby if you take this content first mindset oh there's no question for me that mm. if you think about where the big is is there a big opportunity rugby to create tons of value definitely because it's been all the things we discussed about how it's run are true so it's like anything if, if you take over something that's been pretty averagely or badly run by definition, there's a lot of opportunity, whereas football's obviously been well run. If you, in fact, if you look at the last broadcast deal football did and you net out inflation, in effect, the broadcast deal is pretty flat. Yeah. I know they've marketed it as otherwise. Yeah, it the was. truth is, it was pretty flat. It's more games. games. It's just more games. It's more games. Yeah, it's and more it's games. a bigger number, but it's more games. And I think the other thing, you know, I was just remembering as we were talking, rugby actually did the first fly on the wall sports documentary in 1997, The Living with the Lions, which was actually, you know, very famous um, at the time where the cameras followed British Lions, they had access to all areas. It's a brilliant sporting documentary, actually. And, and it was because genuinely because the players forgot the cameras were there, which were always yeah. the best ones, right, in the end. They're always the best ones. And in 97, 1997, you know, it was well before, obviously, you know, things have become pretty commonplace now in sporting documentary. But that's an example where rugby should look at it and go, when we took the risk and innovated, we got a huge cut through. And, you know, if I think about personalities in rugby, I think they're far, the players tend to be less media trained, they're more open, they're more pragmatic probably means more than to them than it would to a professional footballer and as a result of that I think you could create some real good celebritization of product around rugby players do you need to retrain the players yeah um, yeah yeah I think you do and I think you've got to explain to them why why does this matter what's the mm. benefit to you as a player why does this matter to you because I think honestly the culture of rugby is from a little boy or a little girl all the way through to a national team mm. the team's first by definition of if you play the sport, the team has to come first because you can't perform without the sum total of all the parts. But if you're doing this, you're benefiting the team because you're driving value. You're just driving it through there an you individual go. platform. But you've got to move the culture of rugby a little bit because the team comes first. Yeah. So you'd have to move that. But I think if you explain it, I think they get it, right? I mean, the, all, the, all the guys watch football, they watch sport. They love sport by definition because they're normally sports people. Yeah. So you, if you explain this to them and they get it, I think they'd have a high level of engagement. They'd be well up for it. It's <laughs> does, does this kind of conversation, does it excite you? Does it inspire you or does it frustrate you? Yeah, I think it's... It's more frustrating for me. Um, frustrating at two levels. One, because I think I probably haven't been able to bring about the change that I wanted to bring when I first got involved. If I go back to that drive into Majeski Stadium and meet Martin, I went there with all the sort of naive enthusiasm that I almost, you know, when I first met Jesper and we started just eating the UK together, I went with all of that. I thought, oh, fucking tear up trees. We're going to do that. We'll do that. And of course, then you get in the boardroom and realize, oh my God, nothing is ever going to change. Right? It hasn't changed since like ever, forever. So you, then you, the realities that you then sit in and then frustration bowls over and there's been times in those boardrooms where I've got frustrated and then of course you lose people and you're like, oh God. So 
but you just do it because you care. The truth is you boil over in a boardroom because you care and you're frustrated. Mm -hmm. So I'd probably sit more in frustration. But what I'd say to you is, actually talking to you both, it, it's re it reinvigorates me to think, actually, you know, cut the nonsense here. There's a lot of control we have within our club. We can drive distribution. We can educate player. We can train player. So we can do that. And, and I think- so how easy and cheap to do. It's so I mean, easy and cheap to do. Half a million pounds and you have a 10 person content team. People forget that content does not have to be expensive. We've been trained that actually like yeah, the cost of content super high. It's not. And short form is actually more democratized and cheaper than ever to create. From my exposure to these conversations when we've had them though, the biggest challenge often within ownerships is you, know, you spend a lot of money if it's directly affecting what goes on the pitch, that's fine. You talk about half a million investment that's behind the scenes. And having, you know, you're having a budget elsewhere, it's much harder for you to get that through. Is that yeah. true? Yeah, I'd say so. If you think about the top player in our budget the last three years, wouldn't be a million miles off that sort of level. Um, but that's for a whole content team. I know. Yeah. But that's the point, right? But it's the wrong way to think yeah. about it. It's the wrong way to think about it. Because if you think about, if you think about competitive advantage, because all, all that matters in sport in the end is winning. Why does everyone turn up? You, you turn up to win as an owner, as a player, as a coach. You, you're there to win, plus supporters too. So we're not there to lose. And, and, and the way you do that is to create competitive advantage. Um, that's the only way you can do it. Now you can do that through acquiring talent on the field, or you can acquire financial firepower off the field, which then drives talent on the field. We need to come at it this way around, we think, in order to make it sustainable and also give us a competitive advantage. So where would you put your first as an investor? Where therefore would you put your first, pa first pound? You'd put it there. Because I could, of course, go there on the field first with money, but that short term, it might drive results for the next 12 months, 18 months, but actually it's not a sustainable, returnable model. Whereas if you create a, if you create a unique competitive advantage, you're the first professional rugby team within to really nail that. Mm. But you have to be willing to accept pain in the short term yeah, and the lack of performance yeah, to, be, to be able to yeah, do, do. But That's hard when you've got a fan base, right? Because the it fans is. expect winning and they'll understand what you're trying to do, but they still want the results. Well, that's sometimes where you've got to be strong, right, yeah. as a leader. Well, the good thing about being an owner of, of something is you can make fast decisions. Like, we're, it's not like there's a committee of 27 yeah. people we have to go to. There's two, three people at our club. We make a decision and we do it. So, but, and we have appetite for risk is high. Yeah. Where appetite to risk would be high because we want to drive change and we want to outcompete and we can't do it by doing more of the same. We, we can make fast decisions now and we'll live and die by them. And that's always the best place to be, isn't it? What about it? the other three teams? Yeah, so the other three teams, yeah, well, so the Cardiff have just been bought um, by, um, Cardiff have just been bought by uh, some guys who invest in the Middle East. Um, I think they connected to the city group somewhere. Uh, anyway, so Cardiff have just been bought too. Um, the Swansea-based team, which is the Ospreys, is owned uh, by Y11, which is a private equity, um, yeah. uh, North American private equity sports investor. And then the Scarlets is maybe more traditionally owned, uh, which is the Lenethley yeah. Club in West Wales. They are owned more traditionally by like the local successful business people. There'd be more of that sort of traditional ownership model. Do you guys work together? Because you've got a collective interest yeah. in all succeeding. Yeah, I would say we've worked together in the past badly um, because we ultimately we just all want to beat each other um, on and off the field, which is <laughs> which is uh, which creates a creates a really collaborative really, negotiating standpoint, which is a really collaborative negotiation standpoint. But in reality, I think you know probably out of necessity, going back to break breaking things helps to build things. You know, COVID um, pretty drove us all together uh, because we frankly had to rebuild the game professionally after the back of COVID. So actually, How so? We, just because. What happened was in COVID, um, the funding fell away completely. So eight, basically, we lost 80% of our revenues. So in football, they might have lost 25% or 20%. And so you just had to stomach salaries, everything, and just... And what happened was, up. so we went to government, and government basically gave us a COVID loan. Mm -hmm. So the, the club that we acquired has, has five million, four and a half million of debt attached, which is COVID debt, which will, over the next 15, 20 years, we'll be paying that off. We asked Ryan Smith, who was the founder of Qualtrics, who yeah. owns Utah Jazz. Yeah. We said, do you have a budget? And he said, ah, no. <laughs> to you, in terms of how you think about your long-term capital deployment to the Dragons, or is it kind of... So I know the budget for the next 12, 18 months. In reality, no, I yeah. don't, because... Because by definition for sport, it's, it's not a financial... But have you put a cap on how much you're willing to put in? Uh, yeah, I guess I have, in effect, right? So I'm probably willing to spend... Am I willing to spend millions yeah am i willing to spend tens of millions probably not yeah. and and uh, because you get the point where the risk is just way too high yeah. um, across our ownership team we probably are in that kind of if you think about the ownership team we'll probably definitely be spending a significant amount of money in the next yeah. four or five years but also creative but, you know you've got it you know I mean, yeah, yeah yeah but creative structures now you don't necessarily need to right because you can bring in the right people whether you're uh, 
diluting slightly but attracting that kind of investment from elsewhere that's going to benefit in the yeah, long run so we, without you directly putting that money in you're massively still benefiting yeah and we have to underwrite the risk of a, a 12 million pound turn of a company every year i think our model is to try and grow invest and be sustainable so we're investing significant money up front to try and grow the next year or two the content one i think we should invest more in um and then and i think then hopefully where we get to we hope by 26 27 is where you know we're relatively significantly bigger and then we're spending more on the team winning more on the pitch and therefore you start to drive a flywheel of performance where we're competitive winning and also supporting ourselves financially so that if we did walk away the club is in good hands because ultimately go back to what i said at the start this is a club my dad lives 400 meters from mm. the ground you know so for me to walk away and this thing to fail you know when we lose my dad like literally what's at me going i can own as an idiot literally it's like that right. yeah, yeah i know he's with his, he rung me once he's in the bar with his mates going what are you gonna do about this go dad why are you showing off with your friends when you're like 70 years old why are you ringing me up and giving me crap <laughs> but you know so it matters more than just it's not just a, a sports ownership model this is about community family you know there's a lot of emotion wrapped yeah. up in this um, and we bought the stadium as well and Rodney Parade is, you know is, I think is the oldest professional sports stadium in the UK so it's got a lovely sort of Victorian-esque feel to it when you if you come ever come to the ground it's got this like it has got a bit of a old vibe that these sort of modern stadium bowls yeah. I think they can be a little bit soulless yeah. but ours has definitely got that sort of you know historic feel to it and Dragon. we're right in the city centre which most grounds aren't these days what do you know now that you wish you'd known when you bought the Dragons how hard it would be to move off-field administrators to what I would think was the blindingly obvious. <laughs> well, no, but it, comes, it comes back to that point. You said when you're on your way to Medeski and you're going, yeah, you know, we can just, we can move it all. And then the realities of the depth of challenge within governance become apparent. The trouble is when you've been a CEO, you get this, you get this, um, you get this sense of, oh, if I say something, it probably could have happened. And I probably got the point because I'd like been running Just Eat for a long time. I thought, oh, if, if this makes sense, it's the best argument. We had this rule, the best argument should win, right? It's a kind of cliche thing. But but anyway, we, we had the, so if you had the best, I thought, well, if you've got the best argument, people will just listen and do it, won't they? Mm -hmm. And of course, when you're a CEO, you get this like paradoxical thing where if you do say something, that this is what we're going to do and we're going to do it. Most most of the time, most of the time, it tends to happen unless the board disagree or you have a big fallout with the board. Yeah. So, of course, I went into it with this sort of slightly naive mentality that I'll just go in. <laughs> We're going to do this and this is the right argument and we'll therefore get it done. But what's weird is rugby has the same conversation with itself about those things. And I'm like, in the end, you're like, I, I felt like I'm like, is it the Groundhog Day? That I'm like, am I going mad? Didn't we talk about this three years ago? <laughs> we just did nothing. How do you handle disagreements between ownership if you disagree as an ownership between the right way to go, be it the celebritization of players, be it anything we've discussed today. Yeah, honestly, I would give myself a one out of 10 in rugby because in business, I was really good at this. I think I was really good in the boardroom. I was good at finding consensus. I was good at influencing argument. And I'd honestly, I think most people who work with me, whether it was, you know, various investors would tell you, oh, David's really good at that. He's really good at getting that done. In rugby, because I probably cared too much and it was like my team, I become like arguing about over my kid, like I would my, and it's like you lose your conscious and you end up being like the, the chimp paradox. You're just rolling out your monkey every five minutes in an argument. And I just got fired up too much. So I think um, where I probably, I look back at it, I would have done that completely differently. But I, I think what happened was I tried to do the sort of right argument behavior, realized I was in a room with some sharks, and then I just pulled out my chimp. And the trouble with that is, as we all know, when we do that, you actually kind of lose the people around where you could probably find consensus because that guy's just gone nuts. So I, I, I rolled that out. I'm, you know, I'm a bit embarrassed about it when I look back on a couple of the board meetings I attended where I did you know, pull out my chimp. But I literally did it out of frustration because it's like things weren't changing quick enough. I couldn't believe that we weren't making decisions that were driven by long term. Some of the topics we've touched on here. And I were just like, why the, what the... And I think probably the other thing, I didn't like the feeling that not everyone in the room I felt was showing up for the right reasons. Mm -hmm. Like, what are you giving to the game? What are you taking from the game? I'm here because I want to give. I'm not here to take, I'm here to give to the game. So do you think we suffer from too many career, you know, if it was in politics, we'd say career politicians. Yes, yeah, 100%. The so do you think we've got to get more people like yourself, experiences outside, bring that in, change the game in the right way, utilizing a lot of those experiences to help drive that change. I think you need more people, Harry touched on, who understand how to create distribution and content, who understand modern sport and how to make it from, you know, grow from there to there in terms of growth, um, who are actually probably quite dispassionate. They might not even give a yeah. care about rugby. as a, They might not even go and watch a rugby game. Frankly, I don't care. What they care is they know how to grow 
um, in the audience we need to grow in. If you look at the demographics of rugby, the demographics, if it was most businesses we all look at and invest in, the demographics would worry you. So you need to change. Yeah. So that's why I would say you need more people that don't look like me, but look like that and understand that. How would it go if you turn around to <laughs> GVZ owners, whatever it is, of rugby championship, premiership rugby, and said, let's get together, let's have a conversation, and let's talk about merging of leagues? How did you see that going? I think you'd have a mixture. You've got some really great people running these teams. They're incredibly successful, you know, lands down. You know, there's some brilliantly successful business people running rugby teams who are very bright people in their daily business lives. Where they get stuck, I think, where a lot of us get stuck is in that conflict of interest. So I think you'd end up with a, you'd almost end up with a 50, and this is where inertia, you'd probably end up with 50-50. You'd end up with half the room going, this makes sense. And the other half going, yeah, but we're top of the league and we're doing really well. Why would we want it to change? And so you end up with this self-interested discussion, which is really tricky to move. You'd have probably the people who, who need change going, we need change. And then you'd have people who are quite, you know, first or second in the league, they're sellout crowds, they're winning trophies, going, no, no, this is, a, keep it as it is, no change required. But I think what we have to do is try and get some people in the room who are extrapolated from that self-interest that says, okay, but forget that, guys. Rugby's got challenges that we touched on at the start of this conversation, real challenges. Does this product want to be here in 10 years' time, 15 years' time? There's risk it could not be. No one has an entitlement to exist in a business in a decade or 20 years. If the answer is yes, well, then we need to do some things differently, don't we? And it might involve having to give some change around your own personal self-interest. I'm conscious that's tricky, though, because people do get stuck in self-interest. They do. But that's where some independent people or an investor can cut across it a little bit, can help a bit. If you're being blunt, like, you know, this is not like buying a club where it's like two billion. Like, I think if you were to buy CVC out, you'd probably buy them out at 60 to 65 cents on the dollar, maybe 70 cents on the dollar. So you're probably looking at for the whole holding, maybe 300 million without sounding terrible. It's not actually a vast, vast amount if you go to the right people, the right pension providers, some of the largest sovereign wealth funds, they write those single checks they write those single checks into venture funds, into growth equity funds, they write $500 million checks. And actually, I think there's much more significant upside here. And I think you've actually got relatively protected downside. Um, it's not gonna go to zero for sure. No. So, and actually given the enterprise, I think it's pretty freaking low. Yeah. And given the value accretion on the upside, that you actually you actually have the chance to do a 10X here. Yeah, you do. Which is rare on that size check. Yeah. You know, if you're investing in a fund, you're gonna get a two to three X max if it's a 200, 300 million check. That is the good thing about sport. The downside is protected. Mm -hmm. yeah. They're pretty, as Harry's right, you do the maths, you take about the risk we've taken, you can pretty much forward forecast our revenues plus minus three, four, five percent, yeah. maybe max. Yeah. And we own our stadium, so we have a free old asset in the city centre that's probably worth five, six million. So you you know you have downside protection on the asset, you have downside protection on your rev. So actually, it's not the more frustration is how you get it moving. Yeah. <laughs> if you go back to you know if, if I think about of all the things you do in life as a kid growing up, you know if you, you own a sports team, it's pretty fun. And like you know this weekend at our stadium, Manchester United are playing. Um, you know in Newport, the FA yeah. Cup, yeah. And so, you know, you know oh, that your, your, that's our stadium, yeah. So the stadium we operate and run, uh, Newport Company are a tenant. So Newport Company play their home fixtures there. So this weekend, Manchester United, they're a sellout crowd. The Newport Company are a tenant of ours. Uh -huh. um, so Newport Company play all their home fixtures at Rodney Parade. How much of your revenue is at events driven, corporate <sighs> hospitality? Ooh, close to a third. A third. Uh, yeah, and this weekend, this fixture alone. Wow. This is where, like, you know, sports sports fun, right? If you think about, you know, Manchester United haven't played Newport Company Flyers in like, 120 years or something insane. But this weekend, you've got probably one of is Manchester United the biggest one of the biggest football teams yeah. in the world, right? Playing at our place, <laughs> you know, and it's a bit of a pinch you moment, right? They're like Manchester United about to rock up at our place and play in our stadium, and all that means the community. I can see, you know, we, there'll be like eleven thousand people there, so ten thousand people sold out crowd. Gary Lineker's turning up. They're building a studio. How much do they pay for the stadium? A new book only. So if you do. Because they share costs and everything, it's probably about half a mil. Because the pitch we have is it has to be a proper, you know, same. It's the same pitch as in the, the White Hart Lane Stadium. Those pitches cost about a million quid yeah. just to buy, and then to maintain them is a significant low six figure number every season that you have to spend. So it's a lot of money. Can I ask what's the most large but non obvious cost of running a sports team? Like the one that people don't see, where you don't think you think about players. The biggest cost is definitely the pitch. 
definitely the, the people don't recognize like people think the pitch is like oh it's just grass the infrastructure and the technology in that pitch is incredible like literally it goes down a meter you have drainage when they when they put that pitch in the million quid pitch we've got rodney parade this thing the, 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 it's like a roman amphitheater esque what goes on underneath it right what goes underneath the grass is fucking incredible in terms of all the things you have to build it's literally a three-month build just for the infrastructure for the drainage get the drainage right just the watering costs alone you know is mental um uh, because it's a sand-based pitch so i would say the pitch probably costs you over its lifetime it's costing you multi-millions definitely to run buy and operate every year six figures just to maintain that on top of a million pound buy I actually looked at investing in the company that actually sells the pitches. I actually looked at them. I like uh, you so much. Yeah, David. I, 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 is it a good I, business? It, it's pretty good. Yeah. It's profitable. I yeah. looked at this. It. Good business. <laughs> Unlike most startups. <laughs> <laughs> I actually did look at that. And then I would probably say the obvious one in rugby that probably people don't realise is medical. Because, huh. of course, 15, 20 percent players are injuries. It's, that's that's a significant cost every year. Final one for me, and then we'll do a quick five. But, and unless you, but who's the best owner in your mind? Like which owner do you most look up to and go, wow, you've done a really great job? Right. In rugby or in sports? Generally speaking. I would say there's probably two. Um, the obvious one, obviously, I love what the Patriots have done. I think they're incredible. Um, and the other ones I know, which is the Fenway guys, the FSG, they're on Liverpool. How they think is so long term. And most sports owners are so short term. <laughs> they think, you know, they. And, but when you, when you, when you think about how FSG have addressed Liverpool's performance and how they brought Klopp in and how they thought about it, they were definitely investing in things that would make them competitive over the mid yeah. to long term. And they didn't just go and buy like Manchester United. If you look at Manchester United under the, the Glazer, they bought like super expensive players from Real Madrid, mm. which hasn't driven output. But if you look at if you look at FSG, the way they think about everything is they think long term. Invest in the things that give us competitive advantage over time. So I would probably those, and also I think Henry's just a brilliant investor. So yeah. I, I and I got to know him a little bit. So he's an impressive person. So probably I would be biased towards that sort of mindset um, of long term thinking. I mean, in that situation, it's so interesting because you know, Klopp's first season, he finished eighth in the league, and this is very topical because he's just leaving. Um, but you know, finished eighth and sixth in the first couple of seasons, I think. You know, in, in most clubs. You're gone if you're a top club without oh, been, expectation. In a lot of clubs, you'd have been sacked. Look at no, what he achieved no when question. he was given the time. Mm. But yeah. it's such a rare thing in sport, again, I think, because it's such a results driven business to be able to get that when you are at a club that has the expectations that these top institutions have. Yeah, and Liverpool wasn't obvious. You know, they were a turnaround. They hadn't won the league for like yeah. forever, yeah. Well, a long time anyway, since I was a kid. You know, Liverpool had fallen away in terms of being competitive. So it wasn't so obvious to buy Liverpool, but they clearly had a vision for the club. The other one, though, is, 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 is Wrexham. Hmm. I like what they've done. I've got a lot of respect for the first modern example of what you talked about in British sport. I can't think of another team or <laughs> a sports ownership model as, as innovative as Wrexham. 100%. And yeah, you, then you see like Brady buying Birmingham or parts of Birmingham or whatever. It's a very different mindset and approach. Like I think Ryan Reynolds is truly, truly special. He also understands the importance of, he calls it kind of riding waves, which is like understanding, again, consumer sentiment, but very much moving with it. Like he understood the value of short form and then aligned their sponsorship packages and content to short form. Yeah. But what you see in Not those... to selling stadium branding or to selling logos on the side. He's like, no, 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 we're going to make value in short form video. But what you see about those guys with the other ownerships, and this is interesting, is the time they put to it, right? They don't just buy it, invest into it and let it run. They are massively influential in how that club is. Yeah, yeah. Is yeah they're hands-on, aren't they? They are hands-on. And that's often, I think, where you see the, the clubs where you get the big names in. It's like, okay, you're just literally leveraging a name. You're not yeah. actually giving that education. That's the hardest thing to do because normally when you're an owner of something and it's like sport, it's a hobby, pastime, side project. So that's probably the thing I find hardest about the Dragons is I've got day jobs, in effect. So that's the hard thing. Like, it would be, Do you like your day jobs? Yeah, I love what I do. Yeah. I wouldn't do it. I mean, that's the lucky thing about what I do now, I don't. I don't do anything I don't want to do. <laughs> Probably. Yeah. Uh, Does money make you happy, David? I think definitely not. In my experience, no, definitely not. When were you happiest? I think I was happiest when. Um, that's probably why I said I was happiest when I was poorest. <laughs> that sounds funny, doesn't it? And I'll tell you why. When was you know, that? A couple of times I've been pretty poor. Um, so when I first met my wife, um, you know, she was studying to be a teacher. I was, you know, I had a, uh, I was just literally uh, doing a sales gig uh, in my early 20s, you know, living in London. We all know how expensive that is. So I was properly skint. We were properly skint. 
but it was brilliantly good fun. And then when I was a kid, you know, when I was a kid, I had three brothers. My my mum uh, worked in Sainsbury's um, part time, so it was pretty money was tight. But you got loads of mates. I love school, love playing sport. You know, it was good fun with my pals after school, my brothers, and so. Those were happy, they were genuinely happy times. And look, I've had happy times with money, don't get me wrong. I just, I don't think you need money. I think it was a little bit what I said to you about start with nothing, end with nothing, I've lost nothing. I am liberated by that. Because honestly, if I didn't have money, I wouldn't, I'd be, I could, my kids would struggle. I definitely wouldn't struggle. I, I, I can be perfectly happy. Um, so I don't think it, it, what it gives you is great experiences, right? Nice holidays, live in a nice neighborhood. Kids go to nice schools. It gives you nice things. And the luxury, of the freedom of choice. And, and, you, also, you can I can, pick and, and also, I can, let's be honest, I can buy a sports team. I couldn't do that if I didn't have money, did I? So, of course, that's fun, but it doesn't, I don't think it makes you happy. It just gives you nice things. You're immensely humble. I mean, we haven't touched on Just Eat, but obviously, like, it's an incredible success story. You're immensely humble. Was there ever a time when you weren't and you believed the hype, be it around an IPO, a big valuation? Did you ever have to check yourself? No, but no, I didn't. And I think that goes back to how you brought up. I had, you know, three brothers who rinsed me stupidly. I got the same group of friends you're trying to get rid of. You know, after all these years, you can't get rid of them. It's impossible to become, it's impossible because they would just tell you what the, what's that, or you show, <laughs> you just can't. Also probably goes back to, I don't, I don't get off on that. Probably the only time I did though, I did quite like flying in first as a CEO. That was nice. I like that. I like, and I like flying. I like it when you fly in those like, and they bring in the warm nuts. And the Ricky Gervais joke around when he's like flying with BA in first, and they, he said, there's like the nut joke where they're like, you know, he's like, I want to eat my warm nuts. It's like that's when I realised I've gone a little bit soft. There's something changed in me when it's like, oh, we're, they, they, you know, they haven't brought me the nuts yet, or they haven't brought me a glass of sparkling wine. This is terrible. What sort of flight experience is this? So probably that, there was that. There was definitely those moments where I thought, oh, like, what's happened to me? Where I'd laugh at myself. But no, I don't think so. Apart from flying nicely, I don't really, I can take it or leave most things. Right, should we do a quick fly? Yeah, I feel like we've done some really good ones already. <laughs> yeah, do you want to start? Um, if you were CEO of RFU or Welsh Rugby Union at the moment, what's the first thing you'd do? Oh, first thing I would do is I would, I would um, rip up. Um, how rugby um, makes changes. I'd do it a lot quicker, change people, change change how it makes decisions, and I would be very innovative around some of the things we discussed. I think rugby's appetite for risk should be enormous, should be enormous, because otherwise if the game doesn't make these changes, I think in 10, 15 years it risks a lot. What does it risk? Becoming a fringe sport that is largely, the demographic is a elderly population that is, um, um, that isn't growing around around young people and it risks becoming therefore I think a fringe sport and rugby should be I think it's such a brilliant sport to play to watch to bro I just think it's a brilliant sport I obviously love the pro the game and the values it teaches kids when you play rugby is a brilliant sport and it should be far more mainstream than it is but it needs to make itself mainstream geographically speaking where's the biggest global growth opportunity for the dragons is it america is it south africa is it australia well there's a rugby world cup in the u.s in about five six years time so i think north america could be huge um canada already has a long-standing history playing rugby probably because of british colonialism etc the u.s it's, it's a it's a pretty popular college sport but after college sport, there's not a lot, but they are trying to start a professional league. So I would go US. We thought about going multi-club. We've thought about, you know, do you take one of the American professional franchises on? Um, because in five, six, seven years time, they could be really valuable if the World Cup went well. If you could have one company to come and sponsor the Dragons, who would you choose? Oh, would I have? We've talked about this a little bit. I would love to have some, I think Gymshark would be brilliant um for us we've talked about them a little bit approaching them um in the past and obviously i think harry mentioned me actually funny enough i think some some of the um I, I really like huel as a product um i think something around fitness and health those brands would really lend themselves but i guess i guess i would also like maybe like um an old school brand i think it's quite cool some of the old school brands so maybe a coca-cola something like that i started my career at coca-cola that'd be quite cool sounds like you also need an airline partner for the uh yeah exactly for the first class seat yeah i need the first class seat yeah i don't want to yeah, yeah. Not, not ryanair yeah <laughs> sorry ryanair yeah. But, you know, don't come knocking anytime soon <laughs> f f f final one where do you want to be in 10 years when you think about your tenure you mentioned rugby in 10 years yeah. but when you think about david buttress in 10 years i'd probably like to be I'm quite interested in doing something in government, in politics, believe it or not. 
I had a little dabble a couple of years ago. It was it wasn't a great experience. Um, <laughs> it's, tough. it's tough. It's tough. Don't I, blame yourself. <laughs> no, I, yeah, I, I would, you're not alone. I would. I, there's something about. But if I did it, I would do it in Wales, actually, where I'm from. Quite interested in tackling some big problem. Um, and I could see in Wales there's a lot of poverty, like one third, third of kid, children grow up in poverty and about 100,000 kids a year grow up in, in, in extreme poverty, oh. which is, which is if you think about that, it's mental. Yeah, it's extraordinary. Uh, mental in the UK, like, you know, mental, but it's true. So I, I, would, I wouldn't mind having a little go at that. But as my wife keeps reminding me, you'd be mental to do yeah. that these days because of all the reasons politics is not exactly an attractive thing to get into. But I, I, there's something, there's a masochist in me somewhere that says, you know, why would you not have a go at doing something like that? Speaking of the masochist, then final one for me, you know, you, patriotic Welshman. Yeah. Proud rugby club owner. Yeah. Dragons win rugby championship or Wales oh, win the World Cup? Wales win the World Cup. Wow. Yeah, because, because if I'm being selfish, of course, the Dragons, but Wales win the World Cup, that's the country, isn't it? Like, well, and that's 1966. Yeah. People, you still, you lot, you English, God, you still. you're so nice. I know. No, but you still. I was going, dragons, dragons. Yeah, but that's, you know. But you think, you, if you win a World Cup, like, that's forever, isn't it? Yeah. Like, England still, you, you, every tournament you still talk about 1966. Yeah. <laughs> you still roll that out. Yeah. Sorry. Because right? we've, we've got a lot else to talk yeah, about. Yeah, yeah, no, no, yeah. Yeah. Or, you can understand that because you win a World yeah. Cup, that's forever. And, and, really, and for everyone. Yeah, so for, for Wales, three million people. I mean, national sport, you can't, if yeah. I said, us, I'd feel shitty, right? I, I can't say that. And no, no, no I don't say because it, it feels shitty. In my heart, I I choose Wales. It's I a would, lovely way I would to end. Would be fascinating. Uh, David, thank you so much for doing this. I, I knew that this one would be fantastic. Uh, I was so excited for it. We were so excited for it. So thank you so much for joining us. No, thank you. Thank Good you. fun. Thank you.